somehow we lost uh, Marge. <laughs> there she is. Welcome everyone. Sorry about the delay there. I went live on Facebook and got booted out even though I'm hosting this. So uh, welcome to uh, part five of our revenue conversation series uh, with AARP and Alaska Municipal League, uh, where we're pulling together for uh, a solution for Alaska and um, focusing on revenue solutions for our comprehensive, uh, for a comprehensive fiscal plan. Um, AARP is a membership organization, nonpartisan, and um, we are we are focused on um, making an Alaska where Alaskans 50 and older can stay in their homes, can age as they choose and where they choose. And we know uh, that most of us want to stay in Alaska, and that this issue of solving the certainty of the state's fiscal situation is important to our members. In fact, we did a survey uh, earlier this year on, on this topic after hearing about it from a number of our members. And the survey results told us that overwhelmingly um, our members, regardless of geography and regardless of party or ideology, and regardless of party or ideology are um, opposed to continued state cuts and um, in favor of broad-based taxes and of revenue solutions within a comprehensive fiscal plan. And in fact, um, nearly 60% of our members on the topic of today's conversation support a, a graduated personal income tax at the state level. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nils uh, to talk about Alaska Municipal League and, and their involvement in this conversation series. Yeah, thank you, Marge. And uh, thanks to AARP for partnering with AML on this discussion. I think uh, for AML, we've had conversations about a sustainable fiscal policy for at least 2015 and probably back to 1998. Um, so it's it's near and dear to our heart. And I know for local governments, we depend on a, a state that doesn't have a structural budget deficit. We are inter interdependent with a state that is healthy and robust and can meet its obligations and, and work together with the cities and boroughs uh, to do the same at the local level. So uh, I, I think for us, uh, the, the partnership with AARP and having a revenues conversation is really thinking about how do we write this ship? What are the options on the table? What do local leaders need to know? And what do Alaskans need to know about how the legislature is thinking about all these issues? And there's certainly a, a diversity of uh, perspectives uh, when we think about solutions that are or may be on the table uh, right now or, or into the future. So. Uh, really appreciate, uh, again, this opportunity, this last conversation about uh, revenues uh, in this series um, and the partnership with AARP. Marge? Thank you, Nils. Uh, so before I introduce our guests, I'll say as, as throughout our conversation today that you as attendees, viewers um, online on Facebook or uh, within the Zoom are welcome to submit questions either in the Q&A box on Zoom or in the comments box on Facebook Live. And today we have with us, we're honored to have with us two legislators, uh, Senator Natasha Von Imhoff, lifelong Alaskan uh, representing Anchorage uh, in the legislature in the Senate since 2017. Senator Von Imhoff sits on the Finance and Resources Committees and chairs the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee. And we have Representative Adam Wool representing Fairbanks um, in the House, and he sits on the Finance and the Ways and Means Committees uh, representing Fairbanks since 2015. So welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It's thank great you. to be here. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, so we're about a week away from the fourth special session uh, starting again in Juneau. And uh, thank you all for your service this entire year and your careers to the state of Alaska. 
Um, and I'm sorry, I'm taking an hour out of your, your week or 10 days off between special sessions, but thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to start with some kind of introductory comments, and I'd like you to, to address uh, the progress in the past special session, the, the pl plans uh, that you're hearing about the future special session, and today's topic, an income tax within a comprehensive fiscal plan. And we'll start with you, Representative Will. Um, thanks, Marge, and, and thanks, Niels, for hosting this event, and uh, thanks to all your members. Um, I guess back to the question of the th last special session and, and how, uh, how I feel that went. Um, I, I like the way it ended, so I, I think it went okay, as is the process in, in the legislature. A lot of these things take a long time, and a lot of people wait to the last minute, um, kind of like a, a high school student turning in a term paper. They don't always finish it three weeks in advance, even though they could. They wait till the last day, and that's what the legislature does too. So um, that's not totally surprising or unexpected. But I, I think the net result is we passed a PFD um, of $1,100, which we had done, I don't know, uh, a couple months before that. But um, this time it's for real. And the governor didn't veto it and he signed the bill. So I, I think that's the, the, what one thing that was really good that came out of it. Also, we did not overdraw the 5% draw of the permanent fund, the PUMV draw, which is another goal that many of us in the legislature had. So I think those two goals were met. Um, a sustainable PFD was passed in that uh, $1,100 is within our budget this year without having to overdraw and with the revenue that we currently have, which I think when you talk about a fiscal, um, a structural deficit, um, having enough money to pay the budget items and the PFD that we paid is, is critical. And, and we succeeded in both those areas. Uh, the fourth special session, uh, that the governor called, I think, is to add more money to the PFD. Um, I, for one, am not in support of that because for a lot of reasons, but one is where's the money come from? Um, we would have to overdraw or suddenly come up with a bunch of new revenue. Um, my other objection to increasing the PFD beyond around $1,100 is that even if we did have the revenue, I believe that some of that money could be spent on other things that are more um, essential right now. I, I understand the need for putting cash in people's hands. And there's a lot of people that don't have uh, cash or live in a community that doesn't have a strong cash economy. And I think the legislature is very cognizant of that. There's a lot of floor speeches about people needing money and helping out people that are unemployed due to COVID and, and so on. And um, I certainly support that sentiment However, the PFD goes out to everybody and not just those that lost their job or those that are in need. It goes out to people that don't need it. And because of that, it's a very expensive and sort of inefficient way to help out people in need. Um, it's not a need, needs-based program. So um, going forward, I don't really think there's a strong will to add money to the PFD. There's a lot of talk of changing the formula to a, what's called a 50-50 which would be half of the POMV draw goes out in the form of PFD checks. The other half of the POMV draw goes towards funding government services. Uh, I don't support that formula. Many that do feel that it's, if we had enough revenue in the form of tax or oil taxes or income tax or sales tax or what have you, that we could actually afford the larger PFD. Um, again, I'm more of the school that even if we could afford it, we could spend it on deferred maintenance, on capital budget, on other things that we've been sort of neglecting for many years now, um, pre-K and other, other programs, I think, that maybe we don't even know about yet, uh, things that, that could come up. So I, I think $1,100 is, is a reasonable PFD. Um, I think going any lower than that, the legislature would not have supported it. Um, and we barely got by with the votes needed to pass the $1,100. So um, I'd say the third special session was a success. The fourth special session, uh, I'm not too optimistic about, and I, I hope it doesn't drain um, our energies and our will and our time. And maybe, um, maybe they'll realize that and, and uh, somehow abridge that last special session. But those are my comments on those two special sessions. I'm sure we'll have more time to talk about uh, revenue and the larger fiscal picture and, and other matters, but that I'll, I'll stop right there and let the Senator speak. 
Thank you, Representative. And I know you do have an income tax bill, and that is today's topic. Would you like to speak on that a little bit to get us started? Uh, sure. I do have an income tax. It's HB 37. The bill combines a PFD formula and an income tax. It's a 2.5% flat income tax. Um, and it uh, uses one of the lines on your federal income tax form, the adjusted gross income. So uh, what that bill does basically is it has a formula for PFD, which uses instead of 50, the proposed 50% of the POMV draw, it uses 10% of the POMV draw, which at the time was about $500. It also uses 30% of oil uh, royalties, which is about $500. So that way the check, the first year the check would be around $1,000. Um, tying it to oil royalties, sort of links it more directly to the Alaskan economy. When, when oil is up, our economy does well. When oil is down, our economy doesn't do so well. We've, we've dissociated ourselves from that a little bit using the POMB draw, so we're not quite as tied to oil. But I feel that if there's a PFD check going out um, and oil is up, maybe the check should reflect that. On the other hand, if oil is down, if oil revenues strongly diminish, I don't think we should be paying out a strong PFD check based simply on the stock market and the, the value of the permanent fund. So if oil declines, then the check would decline as well. And looking long into the future, oil could maybe not be as robust as it once was or even is right now. So that's one half of it is a PFD formula. The income tax uh, is a relatively low income tax. A family of four making $200,000, that's two adults, two children, getting four checks of roughly $1,000, they would pay no income tax and they would receive no PFD. So the, the value of the PFD would about equate to the income tax they would pay. That's a family of four, uh, two adults making $200,000. So above that, they would actually pay a check to the state and below that they would actually retain some of the PFD. So even someone making a family making $100,000 would retain about $2,000 in PFD, or, or you could say their two children would keep the checks and the two adults would relinquish theirs in the form of taxes. So the net gain for a family of four would still be a positive gain. So um, as, a, as, as the family finances look at it, they wouldn't be paying tax, they'd still be receiving state funds, which, which I would call a sort of a negative income tax. Um, but that's about where the numbers lie on this form of tax. Also, a lot of people talk about, let's make the PFD needs-based, but by, uh, and this bill also um, exempts the first about $12,000 of income. It's based on the federal, uh, the federal levels, whatever they are. But the, so that way someone of really low income or someone that doesn't have a lot of cash coming in um, wouldn't have to pay tax on their first 12 or for a family about $25,000. So they would be able to keep even more of their PFD. And um, in a sense, this is a way of means testing. And as people make more money, they would re retain less of their PFD to the point where, like I said before, um, $100,000 for two adults would not um, retain any PFD. And that's a way of means testing. Once, you, once a, a couple or an individual is above about 50 or $60,000, they would not get a PFD because their tax would basically wash that out. And that, in a sense, sort of means tests it as well. So if you make below that, you would retain more of your PFD. Um, so I think the bill accomplishes that quite well. The only other thing I'll add is at the time that we drafted this bill, um, you know, about nine months ago, the price of oil and the performance of the stock market wasn't quite what it was more recently. So at the time to pay $1,100 PFD, we would need additional revenue to our revenue stream to support a budget of that size. Right now, we can pay the $1,100 without the additional revenue, without the income tax portion of the bill, which um, might be more politically palatable, especially going to election year. And this, the current administration we have, as many times said, we would not uh, be willing to sign into law a, a broad-based tax at this point. But the future obviously is unknown. Price of oil goes up and down, stock market goes up and down. So I think having another source of broad-based revenue would definitely uh, the prudent thing to do and inevitably will, will be needed. 
Thank you, Representative. And Senator, what are your thoughts on the uh, progress in the past special session, the upcoming session, and on income taxes within a comprehensive fiscal plan? Well, thank you. Um, so in order to prepare for the fourth special session, uh, I did run a new set of numbers uh, to look at the budget at the current uh, updated revenues, as well as the recent HB 3003 that we passed in this third special session. And what I found was that um, we actually have a surplus uh, at the end of the day before paying a dividend right now. And that's looking at $62 a barrel, 65 and 70. So the issue is, is this is what I've been saying to folks all year. Um, there are many ways the state can find new cash and that could be cut government spending, that could be a, sp a spike in oil prices that we're seeing now. It could be uh, revenue from new taxes. We can take it from the CBR, the savings account, or we can take an ad hoc draw from the permanent fund, which I don't support. But regardless of the source, the bottom line is, if we get new cash, how should we spend it? And Representative Wool sort of touched upon this. But, but I think until we answer that, we're actually running in circles. Um, I think we're having the wrong special, wrong conversation as we go into the special session, number four. Um, rather than talking about how much we're paying or how much we're cutting or how much uh, revenue we're raising, instead, we should be talking about whether we are doing a good job right now deploying the current assets that we have to maximize the benefit for Alaskans, both now and into the future. And what I mean is that if we have any additional cash, regardless of the source, should we, do we think that broadband is really important? Low level satellites, uh, fiber optic cables, cell tires. Should we be investing it in alternative energy projects to help provide low cost energy to Alaskans all across the state? What about building roads to connect communities, um, access more areas of the state? Um, do we wanna uh, build infrastructure to provide more tourism opportunities? Um, build trams, trails, huts, things like that. I'm not suggesting that state would do this, but the state could be thinking about leveraging federal dollars, um, uh, partnering with private dollars and so forth. Or what we've been doing in the last few years is paying a dividend with any of our state with our surplus money. So my argue is that it shouldn't be an either or, it can be an and. We can afford a dividend uh, for, for folks all across the state long-term in the future, and we can afford reasonable uh, state services and state uh, investment. Uh, we just can't do at the highest level that people want. It has to be recalibrated. And I think we can actually do that right now without taxes. I think we can. And that to me is the Aurora plan, um, which, which I can talk about when it's, when it's time. Um, my issue with taxes, is um, I pulled the 2018 IRS data for the state of Alaska. And when, it, when you look at it, um, less than half of the state pay federal taxes right now. So uh, it was about 325,000 people thereabouts that actually pays um, taxes when, when it's all said and done. So if we're gonna be taxing folks and turning around and paying an $1,100 dividend, um, this is gonna be really tough, I think, on people um, because we're gonna have less than half the state uh, basically taking wages from one person and depositing it into the personal checking account of their neighbor. And less than half the state is gonna be basically supporting um, having it on their backs. And I don't, think that's, I don't think that's fair. And the one thing, the, the other issue I wanna always try to bring in the conversation is that um, an $1,100 dividend, while that check maybe not, in comparison to a 3,000 doesn't seem that high, but $1,100 costs the state $739 million to pay. So 740 million. And that's pretty material. That's a good chunk of our budget. And $739 million um, could go a long way in education and broadband and roads and so forth. So my, I have the Aurora plan that I'll present that I think um, threads the needle and provides us a, at least a base scenario um, that we can then start talking about uh, how we wanna spend our extra cash 
once we solve the dividend, if you will, then we can talk about how spending our extra cash in other areas to revamp and revitalize our economy. So not just two years from now or two decades from now, but two generations from now, we have a vibrant and uh, a very um, robust economy. So I'll pause there for now. Thank you, Senator. I like that tone of hope. And uh, I'm sure Nilda and I certainly have ideas about how to expand additional state funds um, that we can get to <laughs> at another time. But uh, before we continue our conversation, uh, Nils, what are you getting in terms of questions? Yeah, um, I guess maybe to the representative, uh, there's a question, you know, we're, there, there's a struggle right now to find uh, workers. Uh, so we're having major issues with finding workers in the state. Why now penalize people actually working with an income tax? And so I think the question is, do you view an income tax as a penalty or how should we think about an income tax and its impact to or burden on Alaskans or, or workers in Alaska? And you're on mute, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to pay tax. I, I, I don't know many people that are really dying to pay a tax. We all pay federal tax. Um, that tax gets spent for many things, some that we don't really support and some that we do. Uh, FEMA is spending $87 million or uh, allowing us to spend $87 million to bring up 400 nurses and, and medical staff here real soon. That's federal tax money. That's money we've all paid into that comes back to Alaska. Much of our federal tax money doesn't come to Alaska, although I think Alaska is a net positive state as far as us receiving more federal funds than we pay into it. So we're doing pretty well there. Um, I, I don't necessarily look at it as a penalty. I think it's it's a contribution, just like when I go to Juno and go out to a restaurant, I pay a sales tax at the restaurant. And therefore, when I, you know, Juno's trash is collected or all those stairs and boardwalks all around town are maintained. So, and snow's removed. So I, you know, I think it's just sort of the cost of doing business. For so long, we haven't had a tax. Let's not forget in prior 1980, we did have a tax. I, I moved here just after that. So I, I, I don't, I didn't experience the income tax in Alaska, but many people did. And uh, prior to 1980, we did have an income tax. However, once 1980 came, oil came, a lot of oil and a lot of oil money. And so the leaders at the time said, hey, let's abolish this income tax. And hey, we have so much oil money, we will give out checks. So not only will we stop taking money, we'll give you money. Again, the negative income tax. So, and that's been going on for 40 years, but the oil money isn't what it used to be. And everyone knows that oil has declined steadily since 1988 in volume. Now the price goes up and down. So we have some good years due to that. When it's over hundred dollars, we socked away a bunch of money, which was great, but um, we don't anticipate hundred dollar oil and our production is below a half a million barrels a day. Now, of course, there's many projects and people say, well, it's gonna go back up. But if you look at the graph of oil um, production, there hasn't really been a big increase, uh, certainly to the tune that, that the um, Department of Revenue is projecting. They're projecting another 100,000 barrels um, over the next 10 years, which is, you know, 25% increase or so, 20% increase. I haven't seen a 20% increase ever. Now, not that that's, doesn't mean it won't happen, but I guess back to the question of income tax, why punish workers? I, I, I don't want to punish workers. Um, I want workers to get paid well, that's for sure. I think some of the lack of um, labor has to do with, you know, people looking at their jobs differently since COVID and how much they want to work and how much time they want to spend with their family and is working 60, 70 hours a week to barely get by. Is that really worth it? Now, I don't think, you know, unemployment should should sustain them. And I don't think the PFD should should sustain them. But I do think that there should be also services in communities, in states, in places to to make the quality of life um, bearable and, and sustainable. And so to have good schools and have good transportation. And, and as uh, Senator Von Imhoff mentioned, uh, broadband and things that we really need up here. Let's not forget we have $2 billion in deferred maintenance that's um, un, 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 unmaintained. So we have a lot of backlog and a lot of infrastructure that needs to be done. So some of excess cash that came in would certainly uh, 
has a place to go. Um, I, I don't want to discourage working. I don't want to discourage workers and I don't want to penalize them, but I want to make this place attractive, attractive place to live so we can attract workers in spite of an income tax. And let's not forget, we are the only state that doesn't have a broad-based tax, income or sales. Now there's other states without income tax, they have a sales tax. So people everywhere pretty much pay a tax. Alaska is the lowest tax state in the country, period. All right, maybe just, uh, there's one other question that uh, came in. Um, and I, I've, I've seen this discussed a little bit, but it's related to would a state income tax be deductible from your federal income taxes? And is there some kind of adjustment as part of that process? Do you know how that works, Representative? Um, we were asked this before in committee and I should have this answer at the tip of my, um, and the tax laws have changed recently too. Uh, uh, President Trump changed some of that. So I think it, not as deductible as it used to be. And uh, the senators are agreeing with me on that. So um, yes, I don't think it's as deductible as it used to be. Okay, thank you. Senator? Yeah, so uh, Representative Wool is correct. And I think that was one of the big issues with high tax states in the East Coast. They really got a double whammy uh, during that uh, uh, 2017 tax um, rewrite. But one of the things that I, I wanna kind of reiterate again, as we go forward thinking about this, um, again, an $1,100 dividend. Well, actually, let me, let me back up. Every $500 paid to Alaskans costs the state $325 million. So a $1,000 dividend is $650 million, thereabouts. So an $1,100 dividend is about $740 million. That's what it was this past year. So if we have a surplus, and these numbers right here are showing me a surplus of about between four to 500 million. And again, we don't know what inflation is gonna do. It's kind of going crazy these days. We don't know if the, um, and I'm using spring revenue forecast numbers. And I just took, uh, looked at taps yesterday. Our volumes are down to uh, Representative Wool's point. Our volumes are down than what was estimated last spring. So I think our revenue from the oil companies may be coming in a little lower. So those surpluses will be less. If we, if we choose to spend um, our surpluses and we want to, our target is $1,100, we will have to tax people just to break even, just to bring us to zero. And that will be very le little left over for the broadband and the roads and uh, stimulating the economy. So again, um, we have to be thoughtful about the economic impact because what's happening is that there is an economic impact of number one, continued fiscal uncertainty as well as fiscal instability. And if we are robbing Peter to pay Paul, that doesn't create really a sustainable um, prospect well into the future with different markets values up and down if our permanent fund goes up and down or if the volume goes up or down and then it's just gonna be the backs on the tax holders and only 40% of the Alaskans will be paying taxes. And that's, I think that also creates further instability. And so I just caution um, our, our conversations about um, uh, creating new revenue, whatever the source may be, because uh, without really solving and, real, and deciding what the dividend amount is going to be um, and realizing that an, a $1,000 and $1,100 dividend is about $700 million. And a budget that's, you know, for, we have agencies that are 4 million, that's almost, you know, almost 25%, between 20 and 25% of our whole budget. So just something to think about. So thank you. All right, I think you went on mute. Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I didn't uh, mean to come off glib in my previous comment about uh, how to spend additional state dollars. But uh, Nils and I have had conversations that, you know, the way that the budget's been cut over the past years, that, um, you know, even, even leaving it at the current level, let alone additional cuts, would continue to hurt local services and sustain our 
fastest growing senior population in the state in terms of what their needs are. Um, so your comments uh, about a surplus might come as a surprise to some of our viewers because the conversation has been about fiscal crisis and the need for a comprehensive uh, fiscal plan. And certainly I know that you, you feel there is a need for a comprehensive fiscal plan because you've put one forward. So tell us more about your plan, Senator. Thank you. So one of the important things is, and I, I'm gonna bring back the other comment I made, is when do we get a source of new cash? How should we deploy it? How should we spend it? And I think the issues that we've had in the past is with this calculation of the dividend right now that's very, very high, we're just grabbing cash from all over the place in order to pay it. And I think what makes sense to me is have a dedicated source of cash identified to pay the dividend. And then, then it's solved in my mind. So one of the things that I thought was, what if we took a chunk of money from the, the current permanent fund right now from the earnings reserve account and set it aside and created the Alaska Resource Ownership Revenue Account or Aurora for short. And I think we can do that in light of the recent PCE power cost equalization uh, ruling saying that a dedicated fund is permissible. So it's an idea that it's worth exploring. It does not have to go into the constitution. Um, if the uh, citizens of Alaska wanna push it through a, an initiative, that's a possibility and that's an avenue to do so. But I chose the amount of about 6.7 billion ish to move from the earnings reserve account because that's the amount of money that has not been paid in dividends in the last several years since I think the Walker administration. And what happens is we'll take it right now as of, I just pulled it up August 31st, there's 80.8 .8 billion in the fund. And of course, keep in mind that the fund, the market has lost since then. Well, in the last 30 days, the market's lost about a thousand points. So the market goes up, the market goes down. So we have to be aware and cognizant of that, that even though it looks really great right now, it has lost a thousand points in the last month. Um, so about 80 billion, if we take 6.7 billion out of that, it leaves us $74 billion left in the traditional fund. And then we have a dedicated Aurora account of about 6.7 billion. When you take 5% of the Aurora account, it gives it yields about uh, $350 million, which is just a little over a $500 dividend. Now that can grow over time. We can choose to put royalties in the Aurora account to tie it. I like Representative Wool's idea of tying royalties to the dividend. We can put royalty money in there if we so choose. There will be some steps to, to do that. We can put uh, additional money contributions to the Aurora account. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. But what it will be is that Alaskans can go online under the permanent fund and they can see this dedicated Aurora account and they can see how it's performing and they can see that is a dedicated fund for their dividend in perpetuity or as long as it's there for future, you know, the, maybe 30 years from now, someone can take a look at this, but I want to uh, have a dedicated an, an account and it will grow over time. So we're going to reset or recalibrate it and then it's going to grow over time. And then we have the traditional fund that remains 5%. And I did some quick of the back of the numbers here calculation and it will be sufficient at this time. And this is, of course, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a, a cross section of time to fund government and provide just a teeny bit left over for us to maybe invest in uh, some capital projects, deferred maintenance and other things. So at this point, the dust is settled. We don't necessarily need a tax. If we do have a tax, if, we, if for whatever reason, the legislature wants to talk about a tax, then we can, add a, we can know that the money is gonna go back directly in Alaska to um, provide, um, broadband, provide anything that we really want it to do. We just know it will go back into the economy uh, in terms of infrastructure, which I think is sorely needed. We just haven't done it in so long. And, and especially with this new infrastructure bill that's coming through, 
I think with um, talking to Lisa Murkowski and Dan Sullivan, um, there's going to be matching requirements from the state. It's, it's not just all fed. I, I think that we're going to have to be ready to step up and we're going to need cash for that. So um, anyway, so I, the Aurora account is, is a, is a um, designated or dedicated fund specifically to uh, pay for the dividend in perpetuity growing over time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative, did you want to um, respond at all to that or should we move on to some other audience questions? Well, I just had a quick thought, uh, a quick insight into the Senator's plan, which I, I, I've liked ever since I've heard it. I, I don't really have a problem with, with that component. You know, mine has an additional, uh, mine has a higher PFD and, and therefore an income tax basically. Uh, but the, uh, the Senator Von Imhoff is in a way we almost have the same formula. I'm taking 10% of a 5% draw and she's taking 5% of kind of 10% of the fund. So in a way we each, our, our POMV component is about $500 for each of us. Now I add the 30% of oil royalty that adds sort of another $500. So, you know, and mine, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people in the legislature that, that, think $1,100 is too high and, and $700 million is too big of a budget expense for PFD checks. But there's others that want two or 3,000. I'm not sure 500 is politically attainable, but um, I, I do like her uh, concept. And you know the numbers are sort of jive with mine as far as with regards to the POMV draw. Thank you. And else, do we have additional questions from our audience? Um, we do. I just want to say, I think we just solved it. Um, there, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> celebrate this moment. Um, no, maybe there's there's a question um, online that I want to come back to, but maybe to both of you. I mean, I, I think we've been having a revenues conversation, and you know, all the different options. Um, Throughout, uh, each legislator has kind of also offered something in relation to the PFP and the permanent fund and, and, all, and the formula. Is it a timing issue? Maybe that's the question I would ask for you. And I think, Senator, you kind of hit on it. Let's tackle this first, let's get this right. And then if we separately have a conversation about income tax or other taxes, that's different and that funds government. Is that how you're thinking about it? Is it the timing issue? Yes. And thank you, Nils. I, I think I think until we really solve how, what do we want the state to look like um, 20 years from now and how do we get there? And I think once we solve, once we actually have that conversation, then I think a lot of the pieces will fall into place. And the dividend is such a, a huge component of that. And I, I think that if we just recalibrate it for now and then let it grow, and I, I, I think it will grow over time and we will be able to have both. Uh, Representative, is there kind of reality to that, this kind of step-by-step -step approach or? I, I think so. I, you know, I used to think we need to do all these things simultaneously. And, and the working group that just finished, they sort of said the same thing. They had sort of three components um, you know, cuts, uh, revenue and, uh, a PFD formula, but it all had to happen sort of at the same time. And especially because their PFD formula was really high. I think that they would need high revenue to, to, to cover for it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I sort of share some of the concerns that, uh, Senator Von Imhoff shares, uh, which is if we do have surplus money, how do we want to spend it? And, should we just give out bigger and bigger checks? And, and you hear politicians say, I want the biggest PFD we can afford. And I, I get a little nervous when I hear that because um, I, I don't think we should just keep paying bigger and bigger checks. I think there's ways to use state money that helps people differently than independent than individual checks, You know, whether it's for safety or infrastructure or jobs or education and health and all that stuff. So timing is important. Um, the makeup of the legislature is important. The makeup of who occupies the third floor is important. Um, all those things have to work together and, uh, and agree on, on some of these numbers. And it's very difficult. Okay, thanks. 
There's a, a couple of questions um, online. Um, and it's just back a little bit to kind of thinking about income tax, um, even though we just agreed that that's a future step maybe. Um, uh, this question, I think Senator, um, you talked about 345,000 the last campaign income tax. The question is, do we know what the number of workers from outside the state, is that an additional number or, um, and I would just add how, I know we've focused a little bit on income tax as it relates to household or individual or worker. What about corporate? Um, and if you could both speak to how do, how do we treat corporate income tax in the state? Senator? Although, okay. So um, I don't know how many are out of state workers. I, I can't answer that with confidence right now. So I don't necessarily want to take that, um, take that on right now. Um, so I think the important thing though, is this, this is sort of what I've been talking to people about any type of taxes, whether it be corporate or uh, an income tax, because an income tax uh, is based on wages and businesses and companies pay wages. So I always say, well, what are the economic impacts of an income tax. So put it in the head of a business or a corporation. Okay, so now I have to pay more corporate taxes or I gotta somehow maybe change the wages up of my employees so they can afford to pay this income tax. Um, so, you know, to at least kind of help them out a little bit. All right, well, if that's the case, well, then I'm just gonna hire less employees and pay whoever I have more. So there's gonna be less jobs added to the economy. Um, or, okay, I'm just gonna make less business investments. I'm just not gonna buy that next warehouse. I'm not gonna, you know, buy that new, um, uh, what is it, technology, or I'm not going to buy that new equipment because really I'm actually going to be paying my, my employees, just the remaining employees I have more um, so they can handle this income tax. Or if it's a big corporate tax, then that's definitely their choices. They're just, what I've seen time and time again, when I look at national economic studies and when they've looked at different states and countries, even states right next to each other that have different tax structures, the ones that are slightly higher, they have a stagnant economy. And they can talk about all the reasons why. The, uh, basically because they hoard, companies hoard cash, they don't expend it, and instead they just save and, and pay, pay for it in the government. Now, if we're taking that, if the state of Alaska is taking that money and reinvesting it in roads, to access more, more areas of the state or reinvesting in broadband so people can communicate with one another and do telehealth and telework, or if we reinvesting in education so people have the jobs uh, for this next century, then that's a different conversation. Then we're gonna reinvest it so people you know, can pay consumer uh, payments. It just has a different effect on the economy and we just need to know that going in. Representative, any thoughts on the or corporate income tax structure or? Yeah, the... yeah, thanks. I, you know, prior to 1980, uh, we had an income tax and that meant that Alaska right now taxes, taxes C corps, you know, big, big corporations, Conoco, Phillips, Exxon, um, you know, Walmart, those kind of big corporations. They don't tax S corps, LLCs, partnerships. That went out with the income tax, um, but, income tax, uh, people that own an S corp uh, pay their taxes through their individual income tax as profit. So I'll use Hill Corp that bought BP. Hill Corp's an S corp. They don't pay taxes to the state now, a corporate income tax. BP did, uh, it's estimated and they won't tell us exactly, but it's estimated that with BP buying, I mean, Hill Corp buying BP's assets, the state loses out about $30 million. Now, the owner of Hill Corp, uh, Mr. Hildebrand, I believe is his name, he pays those state taxes in California and Ohio. Other places with an individual income tax, he actually pays those taxes through his personal tax to that state. I don't think it's going to make him pull out of California or wherever he's operating where there's an individual income tax. Um, and I, I disagree with some of the things that uh, Senator Von Imhoff said about profits. And I mean... A lot of people that own businesses that have a really good year, and I've been fortunate enough to be in that position a few times, and I have friends right now that are doing quite well in the construction business. When they have a good year, they spend money. 
because they don't want to pay taxes. So they buy a bunch of equipment. I have friends buying equipment every year because they don't want to pay the tax. So they're buying new loaders and so on and so forth because he goes, I'd rather buy the equipment and, and then I can depreciate it and so on than pay the tax. So you do get a tax break from, from buying equipment. And so it does stimulate the economy. I, I don't necessarily think that if there's a tax, people want to pay their employees more to help them compensate and then lay off more employees. I, I don't know. I think businesses are always trying to spend as little as possible on payroll whenever they can, whether there's a tax of those individuals or not. But, you know, I, I, I can't say I can't speak for everyone on that front. But I do know that we used to tax S corps and all these other corps and now we don't. Um, and, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. And I don't necessarily think a business tax will inhibit business in that state. Like I said, many states do have income taxes that have thriving business economies. Also, there are many out-of-state workers here, both on the North Slope and in the tourism industry. Uh, when they did an analysis uh, for my bill presentation, it's estimated out-of-state workers using two and a half percent formula would pay $40 million into state coffers. So there's a lot of people that commute to Alaska, work on the North Slope, work at the mines, make decent money and then leave. We're bringing in 400 workers right now for nursing, uh, just announced. They're all from out of state. They will go back to their home state. They will not, they wouldn't pay any taxes here. And $87 million for 400 workers for three months. Do the math. That's a lot of money. So um, that's a lot of, you know, revenue that, that, that could be paid here, but isn't. So I, I do think there's a loss by not taxing out-of-state workers. And we have a lot of them. Yeah, Senator. Thank you. Um, again, we're, we're going back to the, um, let's just tax because those darn out-of-state workers are taking their money with them. Okay, well, what are we gonna, again, what are we gonna do with that money? You know, we don't necessarily know. Um, and at this juncture, Alaska has the highest healthcare costs in all of the country. We have, we're basically paying what I have heard from many, many businesses, the healthcare tax. And so um, it's different in California or in Pacific Northwest or what have you, the healthcare per worker is much less. So you're, we're piling on in the event that we pile on an income tax on top of the obscenely high healthcare costs for people, I think it's gonna be, it's hard and, and it's not apples to apples. And so I think it's something that is very unique to Alaska. That's something that we truly need to think about um, as we look at the economic impact. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and uh, I, I really do look forward to future conversations about what Alaska is gonna look like in 20 years and and to how we're gonna invest in broadband and lower healthcare costs, certainly here in Alaska, those are both issues, you know, very important to AARP. I'm gonna take us back to the um, tax question um, a little bit and, and the broad-based tax question and uh, representative, as you considered uh, a broad-based tax and you brought forward an income tax, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, why you made that choice over a, a property tax? That's a that's a conversation that's been had, and I think our viewers would benefit from. Um, thank you. I haven't really thought about property. I know sales. I'm sorry, tax. sales tax. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, thanks. that's one I can hand I can handle right now. Thank you. Um, sales tax. Uh, as Nils know, there's over 100 communities that have a sales tax right now. Um, all probably using slightly different formulas on what they tax. Um, if there's a statewide sales tax, and, and uh, there was a representative that recently put one forward, um, that would, if you have a statewide sales tax on top of a municipal sales tax, and if you want the state to collect it and administer it all, it would have to be uniform across the board. So every community would have to then change their tax formula so they're all aligned. Juno, for example, taxes groceries. Many places don't. Uh, rural Alaska groceries are extremely expensive and, and people that are, 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 don't have a lot of cash, they do need groceries. So if we add a high sales tax to that, that would be um, very regressive. So, and things in rural Alaska are very expensive as it is. So again, sales tax may have a lot of pushback from these smaller communities and I, and I would totally understand that. Um, 
anyone making less than $100,000 will pay more typically in a sales tax um, scenario than in an income tax scenario. Above $100,000, they pay more in an income tax. So if you're looking at people of lower income, they would be adversely affected more so by a sales tax than by an income tax. And um, there's other reasons, but those are sort of the, the ones that stand out right away that A, it's regressive, B, you have to have uniformity. And C, by the way, for every, every sales tax, or there'd be some group trying to carve out an exemption for that group. For example, do we tax services, say accounting and lawyers and so on? Well, the accountants will say, no, we don't wanna be taxed. So then they'll send a lobbyist down to say, don't tax accountants, don't tax, don't tax groceries. Um, so if, let's say we couldn't tax groceries, then the city of Juneau now couldn't tax groceries. And I bet they'd make a fair amount of revenue from taxing groceries. So um, these, these uh, issues wouldn't go away anytime quick. And I think it would be complicated. Thank you. So on the topic of, of regressivity and, and basically how taxes impact people of different uh, income levels, um, there's been discussion and presentations in the past, Senator, about um, how capping the PFD or 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 you know, putting putting a, a leveler on it um, so that everyone gets the same amount and it's a smaller amount than people want um, is regressive. Could you address that and and how you, your thoughts on that? So one of the things um, that I mentioned earlier today is. Uh, identifying the cost of a PFD. So a $500 check is 350 million and so forth. And I think it's important to phrase and frame the, uh, the uh, question in that light. And the reason being is that when you look at government assistant programs, food, um, housing, um, public safety, Medicaid, those costs not only tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of dollars and if the state wants to provide uh, these services that cost money and have a dollar value, just like a permanent fund dividend does, and are very material, um, having utility subsidies, having rent subsidies, having food stamps, food subsidies, Medicaid, your health care paid for, um, when you call the state trooper, they come. Um, these are very material. And I think that it's, there's a balance. There's a balance with trying to afford a check um, a $500 check for 350 million, as well as affording all the different um, uh, social service programs that the state also provides, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's how I generally look at it. Is that, again, I think we can do both. I just don't know if we can do it both at the highest level that um, people want. Thank you, Senator. Any remaining questions, Nils, before we go to closing comments um, today? No, I think the, the one that I, I mean, there's one out there about um, oil tax royalties, which put this into a very different conversation, maybe. And then the other, other one is really more about kind of that personal impact of taxes for, you know, folks who are uh, struggling to make ends meet potentially, or, and, and, and there's a question kind of related about how do we spend less generally as a state? Um, so I don't know if there's anything in there that we want to tackle, but I think we kind of hit on some of that in the last comments. Okay, thank you. So as you as you talk through your your closing uh, comments, um, legislators maybe incorporate some of, some of those thoughts, and we have touched on on most of those topics um, with regard to to oil taxes and oil royalties. We covered those in a previous conversation, so no need to go there. But uh, we did open today with Representative Wool, so we will start closing comments with the Senator. Okay, um, I just, I appreciate this opportunity and I just think it's important for Alaskans to continue um, dialogues and conversations. Uh, Cause I think just even with the level of questions that we could hear, um, people are varied, there's, there's no, really consensus on the answer. And I think that's what Representative Wool and I uh, experience. We're down in Juneau, we have 60 legislators and there are 60 different opinions. And for us to try to coalesce, to uh, come up with a, with a consensus is very difficult. And, and I actually think we adequately represent the variation across the state. 
Um, you know, I even know just in my district right now with 23 and 24, they're very different. And when I go door to door, I can hear um, a wide variety of, of viewpoints of how things should be solved or, or, or you know, the amount of spending and the amount of services and so forth. And I think it's really um, a challenge, but also um, what makes the job so exciting to be able to pick out um, the, the really good ideas that we hear from all over the state and, and then try to craft a, um, a workable solution that can withstand the test of time. And so um, I, I think that's what we're going to try to do coming October 1st and, uh, and continuing in the special session to just keep working. It's slow. I, I mean, I know it looks like we're not doing anything, but please know and please be rest assured we are. It's just a lot of conversations, just like we're having now. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative Wool. Um, thank you, and thanks for this opportunity to speak. And I, I agree with a lot of what the Senator says, and it is it is hard, it's difficult. Um, I think that there's the viewpoint that isn't being expressed today, which is the people that want either a full or a large, you know, $2,300 PFD. And the Senator and I are, aren't in either of those camps. And there is a, a, a bunch of legislators um, that are for one reason or another. And I think that's some of the difficulty. And, and we have a governor that's in that camp, I believe too. So that, you know, if you looked at our books, if an accountant came and looked at our books and says, okay, where, what's your revenue coming in? What are you spending money on? And we have a 600 million, a 700 million, $740 million expense towards individual checks, they'd say, whoa, what, what's that? You know, they, that, that would be a little strange for most people looking at sort of a state economic picture, but we've had it for 40 years and I, I don't really think we're going to get rid of it. And that, that, defines a lot of uh, Alaska to a lot of people that the PFD check. So I, I don't think it's going away. And, and I think it serves a purpose for a lot of people. Um, I propose uh, uh, that same amount of money with an income tax to sort of balance it out. And I know some people think we're paying this money to give to this to this other person. And I guess a certain amount of that is true, same as at the federal level, a, a lot of that is true. Um, but I also think people want money in their hands as opposed to going to apply for food stamps. Not everyone wants to apply for food stamps, even if they may be eligible. And this small amount of money as it is, people can spend it as they want. I, I don't think it should be a large amount of money, but you know, and a thousand dollars today is about the same as the very first PFD check, which was three hundred dollars at the time. It, it was a thousand, but it was for three years. So the first check was about three hundred, which is about a thousand dollars now, coincidentally. Which back then, no one thought three hundred dollars was some crazy amount of money to give to somebody. Um, on the other topic of income taxes, and I'll try to be quick, but if a company moves to Alaska and hires or brings up thousand a thousand employees, it actually costs the state money because we have to um, put their kids in school and, and maybe provide health care and and public safety. So the state incurs expenses that we're not going to regain from that company that won't pay taxes or from those individuals. So I think we have to figure out how if we want to grow the economy like we all do, how we it doesn't cost the state money. And that's a conversation that we need to have. And you know maybe taxes isn't the answer. Um, and maybe right now we can we can scrape by without it. But I think in the big picture, we're going to need more revenue for a lot of the things that we all want to make this state um, uh, continue to be a great place to live. Thank you, Representative. And so today uh, concludes the the five part series on uh, revenue solutions conversations with legislators with AARP and Alaska Municipal League. If you're just joining us today for the first time, or if you want to look back on some of the previous sessions, um, you can find them all at aarp.org slash AK. And, um, and I want to thank uh, Alaska Municipal League and Nils Andresen, its director, uh, for partnering with AARP on this. Uh, in our in our joint uh, goal to keep Alaskans in Alaska as they age and in their communities. And thank you to our legislators today. Anything you'd like to close with, Nils? Only to say, uh, and, and thanks, Marge and, and AARP for everything. I think to both Senator Von Imhoff and Representative Bull, know that we're here, right? We're happy, I'm happy to be a, a resource, a confidant, a 
ex whatever you need, I think there are Alaskans here to support legislators in working through this issue. It is urgent, it is critical, but take the time, uh, let's work through the analysis, let's really understand the impacts of these decisions, um, even as we you know, try to get to them as quickly as possible. So uh, thanks for your participation today. Um, and, and I think for everybody, know that we're all trying to work through this together and, and are here for each other. Thanks. Great, thank, thank you, you Nils. And thanks to all our viewers for taking time to understand our state fiscal situation and participate in these conversations. Take care everyone, be well.